Hi there, I'm Dr. Teresa Cooney and I am a comprehensive ophthalmologist and cornea specialist who practices at the Kellogg Eye Center. And today I'm going to be talking about extracapsular cataract uh, extraction conversion. And there's basically two different, um, two different things I'm going to mainly be discussing. I'm going to be discussing planned extracapsular cataract extractions, but the more traditional um, large incision that's been done in years past. Uh, the smaller incision will be discussed elsewhere, and I will also be talking about converting planned phaco emulsifications to unplanned extracapsular cataract extractions. So first we're going to start out with a brief history. Back in the 1700s, Jacques Daviel basically performed his cataract surgery in an amazingly enough four minutes. That's a far cry from the 15 minutes that we do today for phaco emulsifications, much less the sometimes several hour extracapsular cataract extractions that we do. He used no anesthesia. There was no asepsis, so there was no sterile technique, and he also had no microscope. Obviously, there were frequent complications, and these would include frequent anophthalmitis, chronic inflammation because he would not remove his cortex, capsular opacification, pupillary block glaucoma, as well as uveal prolapse. So in the mid-1800s, Albrecht von Grafe came in, and he had an improved knife that allowed for better wound apposition, and there has continued to be improvements over the last several hundred years. So what are the preoperative indications for extracapsular cataract extraction, or ECCE? Basically, a lack of phaco emulsification equipment, and this often happens in underserved areas overseas, not so commonly, luckily, in the United States. Very dense cataracts that are too hard to phaco can have extracapsular cataract extractions, as well as zonular concerns. Intraoperative indications include anterior capsular extensions during the capsular rexus, zonular concerns, or nucleus that is too dense to remove during phaco emulsification. Contraindications would be insufficient zonular support for safe removal, and these are more likely to be better removed with intracapsular cataract extraction or with a parse plane of atrectomy with a posterior approach for removing the cataract. So what are the advantages of extracapsular cataract extraction over intracapsular cataract extraction? First of all, the incision is smaller, there's less damage to the corneal endothelium, and therefore a less chance of developing bullous keratopathy afterwards, less induced astigmatism, a more stable and secure wound, and an intact posterior capsule. This in turn causes reduced risk of vitreous loss, better intraocular lens fixation, reduced retina complications that would include cystoid macular edema and retinal detachments, reduced swelling of the cornea, an intact barrier between the aqueous and vitreous with less VEGF transfer and less anophthalmitis, and a safer secondary surgery if it was needed. Preoperative considerations that you want to look at. Pupillary dilation is critical. You want to make sure that you use preoperative topical midriatics as well as cycloplegics in, in NSAID drops to try to maximize this. And if your pupillary dilation is not sufficient, then iris hook should be considered or sphincterotomy if you continue to have poor dilation. The reason for this is that if nucleus expression is performed during extracapsular cataract extraction without a sufficiently dilated pupil, you can have significant iris damage, including iridodialysis. So first of all, we're going to start out with the incision. If you know that you're going to be performing extracapsular cataract extraction, you often will prefer to do a superior scleral tunnel. If you're not sure whether you may do one or you may not, you still might want to do a superior scleral tunnel, and to do so you need to do a pyridomy. The pictures below here depict how a pyridomy is done. So basically you use tooth forceps and Westcott scissors, and you want to make a little snip in the conjunctiva. You can use the Westcott scissors to separate the conjunctiva from the underlying sclera, and you want to snip along the length of the limbus to the width that you would like. And in this case, it's usually about 11 millimeters, so you can mark that before the surgery. Once you have most of the adhesions removed, you want to perform wet field cautery, and you want to then create a paracentesis, depending upon whether you're right or left-handed, supratemporally or supranasally, and then inject some viscoelastic material. So this animation here just depicted how a superior scleral tunnel incision is created. So basically, you start making the incision two to three millimeters posterior to the surgical limbus. The cord length should be about eight to 12 millimeters, and the initial incision should be made as a limbal groove with a crescent blade. Then you want to extend the incision into a tunnel, and this anterior dissection or tunnel is made with a crescent blade where you're basically going to go into the previous groove that you made and tunnel into the clear cornea, which is the area of the vascular arcade. Initially, you want the toe down and the heel up, and then you want the toe up and the heel down so that you're going along the contour of the eye. And this depicts it over here. This is a look from the side, and this is a look from the surgical perspective. And you can see there how they're using the tunnel to make that incision. 
After the incision or the tunnel is created, you want to enter the anterior chamber with a keratome in the center of the scleral or corneal tunnel. And the anterior chamber at that point should still be filled with viscoelastic. The next step we're going to proceed to is the anterior capsulotomy. If you know or that you may possibly be doing an extra caps or cataract extraction, this should be done through the wound before enlarging the wound so that the anterior chamber stays formed more readily. The continuous curvilinear caps or rexus can be made, as you normally would make with phaco emulsification, and then four relaxing radial incisions can be made from the caps or rexus. If you know, again, that you'll be performing an extra caps or cataract extraction or thinking that you might, you can instead opt for a can opener capsulotomy. And for this, you use a cystotome or a bent needle to basically make an initial puncture inferiorly, and then you want to pull it centrally. Subsequent punctures are then made peripherally and pulled back to the previous puncture, kind of doing like a connect the dots a puzzle. And each puncture site can then tear radial if it's stressed, so you have to be careful for this and it's done on both sides. And then when you're all done, you wanna sweep with your cystotome all the way around your can opener capsulotomy to just make sure that your capsule is completely open with no adhesions. Next, we're gonna proceed with nucleus removal. Again, we perform a hydrodissection just as you would do with phaco emulsification, and this would in turn loosen the nucleus from the capsular bag. And again, if there's any concerns that there may be zonular issues, especially if this is a very dense cataract, you wanna be somewhat gentle with this portion of the procedure. The nucleus is then rocked up and down, so you basically take your cystotome, you embed it into the nucleus, and you rock it up and down to just make sure that it's loose and starting to prolapse from the bag. And then you also want to rock it from side to side, and you want the nucleus ended, pushing down, so that the nucleus is tilted up towards you at the wound. At this point, you want to proceed with widening the wound. So the scleral or corneal wound is widened to a mid-limbal cord length of 8 to 12 millimeters with scissors. Now, if you're performing phaco emulsification and um, you all of a sudden decide that you might need to convert, here are some of the signs that, oops, things haven't gone as planned, and so uh, it might be time to convert. If you suddenly notice that the anterior chamber depth deepens, that may be the sign that there's a capsular issue and we may need to convert. If the lens is beginning to look unstable, you might want to consider it. If you have an incomplete capsular rexus or you have some radializations of the capsular rexus, you may want to convert. Or if you start seeing vitreous presenting into the anterior chamber, you may want to convert. Now, if you are not planning this extra cap but actually converting, you're going to need to make some changes to the incision. Most phaco emulsifications now use temporal clear corneal incisions, so at this point you're going to need to widen your clear corneal incision as opposed to your scleral tunnel to a mid limbal cord length of 8 to 12 millimeters, just as we did with a scleral incision earlier that we talked about, with a crescent blade which provides better wound construction, or you can use scissors if things need to happen a little bit more quickly. This is done at the time that the decision has been made to convert. And so basically here you can see that they're using a crescent blade, but here you can see again they're just putting scissors into the eye while they're just supporting the eye with a forceps and just opening up using scissors to open the, the wound. If you've done a capsular rexus, you will now need to make those four radial relaxing incisions that we had discussed earlier to allow adequate room for the nucleus to express because it will not be able to express in whole from the small capsular rexus opening. In removing the nucleus, there's some consideration that you may want to give to placing a couple safety sutures, which you can see here, one on either end of the wound. And these can be done for quick closure in case of the unforeseen complication of having explosive hemorrhage during the nucleus expression. A lens loop then is used to provide posterior pressure on the posterior lip of the wound and then behind the nucleus once the expression begins to help remove it from the eye. So for the next step of the nucleus removal, you're gonna also have a muscle hook available in addition to a lens loop. Once the nucleus expression begins, again, you will have the lens loop placed on the posterior lip of the wound adding pressure, and then you're gonna use a muscle hook to add some additional counter pressure on the surface of the cornea, rolling in in a superior rolling fashion with a muscle hook to assist in the nucleus expression out of the eye. So again, here are just some pictures of nucleus removal. Again, this surgeon decided to put some of these safety sutures in for quick closure in case the need arose. Again, you can see that the lens loop is placed inside the eye, trying to get underneath the prolapse portion of the superior part of the lens. Again, additional pressure is placed on the posterior lip of the wound. And 
additional pressure is placed, again, you can roll a muscle hook across the eye to add more pressure, and it's basically rolled out of the eye and onto the lens loop. And here is what a nucleus looks like after it is expressed. Now, there's also smaller wound nuclear removals that can be done, and that will be discussed in another segment by another surgeon. And you can also fragment the nucleus using forceps or nucleus splitter and deliver it in smaller portions. So the next portion is wound closure. Now you have this 11, 12 millimeter wound that you need to close. What you initially want to do is partially suture the wound using interrupted 10 nylon sutures. And this allows the anterior chamber to become reformed because at this point the eye is rather flat and it can then be better maintained, but you still have to leave space to perform the irrigation and aspiration of the cortex and to place the implant. Then irrigation and aspiration is used to remove the cortex by stripping peripherally and centrally. And again, you want to be careful of the capsular edge just like you would with any cataract surgery. You can then polish the posterior capsule as needed, and this basically just shows a picture of that. Now, intraocular lens choices. If there's sufficient capsular support, you can put an MZBD intraocular lens insert into the sulcus or capsular bag with IOL forceps. And at this point, you don't often have a distinct capsular bag because your capsular rexus has split through your radial incisions, and so you're kind of placing it in the sulcus and or the capsular bag. This specific lens allows for a larger intraocular lens diameter and an optic that will then better fixate. If you don't have sufficient capsular support, you can either suture the implant to the iris or you can place an anterior chamber on intraocular lens, or if you're very brave, you can scleral suture an intraocular lens. At this point, you want to fill your anterior chamber and or your sulcus and capsular bag with viscoelastic to allow for the insertion of the lens. At this point, you may need to cut some sutures. You want to measure your opening. You need at least a six millimeter central opening in your wound to insert a single piece intraocular lens. And once the intraocular lens is placed, you want to then remove the remaining viscoelastic with your irrigation aspiration port. And you will use the irrigation aspiration port if there's no vitreous present. If there is vitreous present, you're going to want to use the vitrector that will also cut and prevent issues with vitreous removal. So for wound closure, you're going to place multiple interrupted 10 nylon sutures, and you're going to want to trim the ends and either bury them or rotate them posteriorly away from the cornea so that they don't cause discomfort to the patient. What is super, super important is proper wound edge reproximation. You want an equal wound depth on both the anterior and posterior lips of the wound. You want to make sure that there's adequate suture tension to prevent corneal wound slippage. And that would occur if you have too loose reapproximation, because this would cause against the rule of stigmatism. But at the same time, you also want to avoid excessive suture tension, which would cause a significant amount of width the rule of stigmatism. So you want to just find that exact amount of correct suture tension. When you're all done, you're going to want to check your incision to ensure that it is watertight. And if the pritomy had been made, you want to close the conjunctiva with interrupted adovicral sutures or with um, cautery. At the completion of the case, you may choose to give some subconjunctival injections of steroid and or an antibiotic. I typically do this only if there's vitreous that presents, and I would use Decadron 4 milligrams and Kefsol 50 milligrams or Genomycin if they're penicillin allergic. I then place 50% diluted betadine on the ocular surface, and I covered the eye with Maxitrol ointment, an eye patch, and a Fox shield. So for post-operative care, if there have been vitreous issues during the surgery, I will add a topical NSAID, like uh, Ketorolac, to my topical steroid regimen. You will notice that there's a steady improvement in vision, not necessarily perfect vision the next day, but a steady improvement in vision. And I tell my patients it can take weeks to sometimes even months for them to get their vision, but they will ultimately have good vision. If there's a significant amount of with the rule of astigmatism, meaning astigmatism at 90 degrees, you're going to want to start cutting the sutures on axis, which you can get either from a manual keratometer or from a topography unit, beginning at about six weeks to make sure that the wound has adequate time to scar in. You want to delay the final refraction until a couple weeks after the sutures are cut so that you know that the refraction is stable and you're not going to get a shift in their glasses prescription. Now, if there's a significant amount of against the rule of astigmatism, meaning astigmatism at 180 degrees, you may need to have to consider a secondary surgery because it's likely that the wound slipped and you need to reapproximate those wound edges in a better fashion. So the keys to a successful case. It's never, it, it's never necessarily um, uh, a super smooth case, and there's going to be difficulties that present, even if you know you're going to have a plant extra capsule Cap, extra capsular cataract extraction, but especially if you're going to have to convert to an extra capsular cataract extraction. But the key is to stay calm. If you get all upset, things probably are not going to go nearly as well as they should go. What's super important is good wound construction, good wound closure, 
Again, you want to make sure that your iris is dilated appropriately and that you have a good size capsular rexus with radial extensions to prevent for adequate removal of the nucleus from the bag. And again, you want to make sure that the lens is adequately mobilized so that it will present easily from the bag and out to the external part of the eye.